All right. So now it comes the time for trajectory inference analysis. Um, yeah, this lecture has been given by OSA previously, and this is a brief update on, on that as well. So, so far we got the read, the counts, normalization, PCA, dimensionality reduction, UMAP, and clustering. And then it comes to the step four, finding trajectories in your data. So this, the trajectories is usually a different approach for differential gene expression. In differential gene expression, you have more uh, the, the two groups that you found, found. So like either a control versus a disease, um, or you have the different clusters and you find the different uh, uh, markers for, for each one. So trajectory could be also just a, a, another way of doing the, the same thing. Or you can also just try to find trajectory in a, in a um, to find linear uh, uh, changes in, in your data rather than black and white group A versus group B. You try to find what is being expressed over the time course, uh, and I'll go through that a lot. And then from trajectory, you will use, for example, normalized data or count data. Uh, you can use PCA or any other different embedding. Uh, for the, the differential gene expression using uh, trajectory inference. I can just put the laser pointer here. Yeah. And that also is data set specific. Some data sets, there is no point in doing trajectory. Uh, if you have batches and other uh, sequence as experimental conditions, maybe you have the patient versus control, and then you want to find differences between them. Um, and many other things will also affect how you should think about trajectories. Um, yeah, and from TSNE, you map, you also can do trajectories. And I'll go through that over the, the time. Um, so what is actually a trajectory or uh, this pseudo time, what you see in, in the papers? So pseudo time is just an uh, arbitrary unit to define uh, a biological process. So it could be literally anything. So in this case, for example, if you have one, one experiment with cell culture and then you uh, induce, you add some stimuli to those cells. And here you can try to find some like activation or developmental time that those cells have. So at time zero, they, are, they don't have any uh, path. Basically they are at the time, developmental time zero. But as you progress in the experimental time, some of those cells will start to develop into more activated or mature cells. And this is the developmental time, not really the developmental time in times of time or hours or minutes, but rather into developmental genetic develop development. So here you have, for example, cell activation. And in many cases, what you see and is that you have uh, different snapshots of your cells, so some cells you don't have uh, a, a development and some cells you have. Uh, and that's usually what you see in tissue. So in many cases, what you want to have is like uh, cells that have intermediate states, more advanced states or very primary states as well. So all cells uh, differentiate in a continuous spectrum. So and these are the transcriptional programs for activation and differentiation. So they don't just go from uh, one cell to another uh, out of the blank. So there is always a, a path to go on. The problem is that, for example, if you con consider the time nine here, and if you only sample at this time, you don't have the intermediate state, uh, states. So it's hard for you to find which are the program that connects those two cells. So, and for that reason, you always need, try, need to try to sample more samples or have different time points, experimental time points, so you can get the intermediate cell states as well. Um, so individual cells will differentiate in an unsynchronized manner. And that's the same thing that is exemplified in here. Not all cells will be at the same stage of development, uh, not even in cell culture and not even in a, in a mouse. And each cell is basically a, a snapshot of this differentiation time, this activation point here. And then pseudo time again is this abstract unit of progress. It could be represent anything, uh, developmental time, cell activation. It could be changes in the position in the tissue, uh, 
for example, migration from blood to the tissue or anything like this. And basically it just represents the distance between a cell in the start of the trajectory and then in the end of the trajectory, whatever that represents in your data or in your biological question. So before you run any trajectory inference analysis, you should make sure that you have a developmental trajectory or some uh, trajectory uh, changes in your data set. Do you have all the intermediate states? If you have two clear clusters, let's say T cells and, uh, uh, and progenitors in the bone marrow, you don't have anything that connects them. So any trajectory that you set in, the, in this data set will be meaningless. Do you believe that you have a branching in your trajectory? So you need to know a lot of the biology of your system before doing that, because in many cases you might uh, find trajectories that bifurcate, or in, in some cases you don't need to account for that. And every model that you have for trajectory depends on, on these information. So you need really to know the, the biology. So doing all the steps that we have taught you so far, and really understanding the biology, which markers are present, uh, which cell states you see in your data set is really important before doing any trajectory analysis. So, and this is a slide that I will repeat in the end later as well. So be aware that any data set can be forced into, into trajectory without any biological meaning whatsoever, because trajectory is a model that you fit into your data. So if I have just a random data set with no biological information at all, you can always fit a trajectory, ah, this cell to, the, to that cell. And that is, will be meaningless because the, the data set is meaningless. So be aware of that. So the other thing is first, make sure that you have a gene set and dimensionality reduction that captures what you expect. And I'll go through that a little bit uh, as well. So the gene set means use all the highly variable genes that you have in your data set. And the dimensionality reduction would be some of the uh, points that I'll mention as well. Um, so for example, TSNE and UMAP, they will try to force things into groups, and then you don't have any connection in the dimensions uh, between the groups. And that will skew or completely mislead your trajectory analysis. So you need to have a, um, a dimensionality reduction that connects the cells in all the intermediate points. And I'll talk about some of the other methods for dimensionality reduction for this. Although you can use UMAP, but you need to change those parameters so that the intermediate cell states are also connected. Um, as well as any other step for uh, single cell analysis, trajectory inference analysis is also uh, comprised a lot of methods. So here is still, let's say, old for 2018, 2019. Uh, you have up to 60 methods for trajectory inference analysis. Being that Monocle 1 was the first one in 2014, Monocle 2 or 3 uh, was about here in 2017. Um, and these are usually the one of the references for trajectory analysis, but there are many different ones. So some things to take in consideration when doing trajectory is that which trajectory do you want to model with? So for example, you have a cycle trajectory, let's say a cell cycle is one of them, or cells that can cross differentiate uh, to, to each other. Let's say uh, stem cells as well. They can uh, cycle like this, or uh, some T cells have been uh, shown to be plastic, so they can actually cross differentiate uh, across themselves. Or you have a linear trajectory that just one cell goes to another and doesn't come back or you have a bifurcation, especially for example, in the bone marrow, it's quite clear to see such bifurcation or multifurcation or uh, tree. And that depends on how complex or how many cells you're including in your data set. So for example, if you have a bone marrow data set, this is the most common way of, of finding it because you have so many different cell types that start differentiating into each other or a connected graph that has both cell cycles or uh, and specific uh, endpoints for differentiation. And this is, for example, very um, present in T cell and B cell biology. Or disconnected graphs when you have like so many different data sets, so like different tissues or different cell types, and you try to model everything at once. And this, of course, becomes even more complex uh, every time. So 
you need to think up really about what you actually want to show in your data set. Here is just another representation uh, overview of the, the different methods or strategies. There are many different methods here, just listen a couple of ones. But basically, you want to find a dimensionality reduction technique to, to use, or to you don't want to do that on the raw data. So you can use TSNE, UMAP, PCA, ICA. There are many other ones, and diffusion maps, uh, I will talk about them. So you can also do on a graph, and I'll say that about uh, Paga, for example. And then you want to find the structure of your data, either using the KNN graph or a minimum spanning tree that I'll also talk about. And then you want to find a, a, a trajectory modeling. So how cells go from one point to another point in, in this, either in this graph or using the, the, the dimension uh, that, you, that you choose. Uh, 